All right, so I want to return now to my series on the great philosopher of history, Arnold J. Toynbee. Here's his Wikipedia page. Um, and I started the first chapter of this. I want to go chapter by chapter through the unabridged study of history, which is gigantic, 12 volumes long. Um, and in the first video that I recorded uh, last June, June of 2020, um, which you can pull up here on YouTube, we discussed the introduction. And so now I want to get back to and resume the discussion of the book uh, with the second chapter here after, that occurs after the introduction. This is a picture of Toynbee. He had a very long life, um, born in 1889, and he died in 1875 at the age of 86. So he lived a good long life. And speaking of birth dates and so forth, I want to glance at his astrological chart uh, before proceeding and um, and also compare it to the chart of uh, Oswald Spengler. This is Spengler's chart. And so um, since Spengler was first off the mark here, let's take a look at his first. This is his uh, midheaven. This is his ascendant descendant axis, the eastern horizon, the western horizon. And this is straight up. Uh, this would have been noon if... If he had been born at noon, the sun would be right here, but he was born uh, close to uh, twilight, it looks like. And um, so he has Uranus, which is the planet of rebellion, revolution, and of overturning old, worn-out ideas, almost on his midheaven, which is the public career. The ascendant has to do with your ego, and the descendant has to do with one-on-one -on -one relationships with other people, and the nadir, uh, straight down, has to do with your relationships to your parents. So all four angles pertain to social relationships uh, between self and others. And then so so he's got Uranus at the midheaven for, obviously this is a person who's going to do something revolutionary in his career. And it's in the ninth house, which is the house of the higher mind, the philosophical mind. The third house is the house of the lower mind. And he has the moon in that house. And the lower mind corresponds to Gemini. It has to do with what is meant in German idealist philosophy by the term Verstand, the understanding, which gathers data and collects it. The moon has to do with emotions. And uh, the ninth house then uh, has to do with the higher mind. This, this is the Sagittarius correspondence that uh, has to do with the higher mind. Uh, philosophy, metaphysics, religion, and so forth. So this is a person who was born to achieve something in that realm of metaphysics and philosophy with a very public career. Um, so over here, this is his sort of power cluster of planets. This is a stellium of Sun conjunct Mercury. Uh, and then Venus is conjunct Pluto right on his uh, descendant. Venus has to do with aesthetic satisfaction. Pluto has to do with the will to power. Uh, Nietzsche has Pluto opposite uh, the sun on his chart, which is the will to power. Mercury is, of course, the intellect, and the sun is the self. And so Mercury is conjunct the sun here, a very person with a bright mind, obviously. And one-on-one -on -one relations with others are colored by this... Um, this intertwining of s sexuality and aesthetics with Pluto. Very often individuals, I don't know anything about Spengler's romantic life whatsoever other than that he never married, but very often individuals with that Venus conjunct Pluto have unusual and unconventional sex lives. Um, he never married, so I'm not sure what his orientation was. Uh, he's got Neptune over here, Saturn uh, down here, Jupiter here. Let's see, so uh, Saturn is quincunx, that's a 150 degree angle to his ascendant. That's Saturn uh, would confer on one's personality, the, the ascendant, a slow, methodical, patient uh, demeanor, um, countered by an aesthetic satisfaction with, with the Venus here on the descendant um, and the bright mind gathering and harvesting this data. And then we have, let's see, Jupiter is sextile at a 60 degree angle with his sun Mercury conjunction, giving it even more power. This is a very, very bright uh, individual, genius level here. He also has, speaking of the genius archetype, he's got Uranus square Sun conjunct Mercury. Um, so this is an individual who's going to overturn established ideas about things, specifically history. Um, and Saturn has to do, one of its aspects is memory, uh, and it would be the historical planet. Um, too far away to be conjunct with Jupiter. They're 12 degrees apart, but they're in the same neighborhood. Uh, let's look at Toynbee's chart then. So Toynbee also has, uh, coming out of the same generation then, because Uranus is a very slow-moving planet, 84 years to go around the, the, the sun. And he's got Uranus in the same spot. Um, and let's see. 
where are we looking at here? He's got, uh, he has it in opposition to Mercury, Uranus opposite Mercury, whereas Spengler had Uranus uh, and the Sun with a conjunction of Sun and Mercury. And here he's got the Sun, uh, again, about 12, 12 degrees away. It's in the neighborhood, but it's also opposing Uranus, the genius archetype here uh, in the same place category. Here's Mars conjunct Venus. That's a good for, uh, especially in the fourth house, which pertains to the domestic sphere. That's Cancer. Uh, must have had a good home, stable home life. He did have two marriages, but they were long ones. And then uh, Neptune conjunct Pluto. This is his spiritual interest. Toynbee is a very spiritual thinker. And as he proceeds with his study, he get, religion comes to matter more and more and more to him as the single most important motivating force in history as it is. And, uh, and Spengler has that same attitude, despite the fact that Spengler is coming out of the German idealist tradition, especially that of Goethe's, and Toynbee is coming out of the British empirical tradition. As we'll see here, first he starts with concrete facts, and then generalizes uh, to draw larger uh, ideas that confer synthetic unity on the manifold of those facts. And here the moon is trying, uh, so his emotions are very strongly bound up with the, the Neptunian spiritual impulse with a very strong power, interest in, in power. Sometimes this codes for the, for the occult and the supernatural with Neptune and Pluto. Um, and then Saturn here is directly on his ascendant descendant axis, uh, which we would expect, especially with Toynbee, who, who wrote this book over a period of something like 20 years, 1933 for the first three volumes, and then the last three, I think, are 1954, and the middle three are in there. Uh, it's a series of, or four, uh, almost a series of trilogies. One of the volumes is just a collection of uh, maps. Um, we'll look at that, actually. The maps are very useful. Uh, slow, patient, methodic, uh, with his personality as well, similar to Spengler. Um, so it's interesting. Their, their charts are very similar, uh, and they have similar uh, temperaments. All right, so... Let's then take a look at this chapter, uh, and then we'll get to this map, which is the Treaty of Verdun in 843, whereby the grandsons of Charlemagne divided Europe into three distinct corridors or domains. Um, but first, so chapter two is B, the field of historical study, uh, Roman numeral one, the test case of Great Britain. So we left off last time in the first video discussing the introduction with the idea that um, there's a parochialism when historians write, French historians tend to, uh, when they write a book of universal history, they tend to just put France in the center in a Ptolemaic way and make everything revolve around France. British historians are guilty of the same thing. German historians also. So we want to get out of this parochial model. So note too that Toynbee then is shifting, although he doesn't put it in these terms, from a Ptolemaic model to a Copernican model, just as Spengler had done by ditching the ancient medieval modern scheme where everything revolves Ptolemaically around the West uh, in favor of his Copernican model where each of the nine high civilizations, each one of them has its own, is its own center of gravity and has its own history. Uh, same thing here uh, with Toynbee. So he says, the test case of Great Britain, and what he does, he almost proceeds sort of like an archaeologist. And I love Toynbee because he has lots of imaginative metaphors, uh, both in method and in ideas. And so the method here, he proceeds uh, like an archaeologist, and he says, well, let's look at the history of Great Britain um, and look at it as a series of seven strata um, and see if we can go back through these strata and just see if we could write a universal history in a parochial fashion, strictly from the viewpoint of Great Britain. And as it turns out, the answer is, of course, no, because the farther back we go in these strata, he says, um, the more entangled uh, Great Britain appears to be with the continent. It's not separate from it. So he says, A is the establishment of the industrial system. So that's the last quarter of the 18th century. Go down to the next stratum earlier, the establishment of responsible parliamentary government at the end of the 17th century. The next stratum, the expansion overseas beginning in the third quarter of the 16th century. That's uh, moving into the time of Elizabeth and John Dee um, and Shakespeare and company. And then down D to the Reformation since the second quarter of the 16th century, down to E, the Renaissance, uh, last quarter of the 15th century. And he pushes it to two more strata, the establishment of the feudal system since the 11th century, 
And then finally, the conversion of the English from the religion of the so-called heroic or barbarian age to Western Christianity since the last years of the 6th century. So those are the seven strata. And he says, okay, well, let's start with the Industrial Revolution that was invented in Great Britain, and it does seem to hold with the model of Great Britain as the unit of intelligible study, if we wanted to put it that way. Let's go down to the next stratum. Parliamentary government, on the other hand, was also, uh, it wasn't just a British thing, it also involved the French. Both the Bourbons and the Stuarts were involved in this. So already we're starting to get entangled with the continent here. How about the expansion overseas under Queen Elizabeth? And obviously, um, they, she fought a war with the Spanish Armada, um, the politics along the coast, uh, this, the whole Atlantic seaboard doing trade with the continent. Uh, so now we're getting further and further entangled. The Reformation uh, did not originate uh, in England, but it was exported from Germany into England. Um, the Renaissance was a creation of Italy that was also, at the end of the 15th century, exported to Great Britain. And then the establishment of the feudal system, the whole thing was feudal. Uh, to use Carol Quigley's term, instrument of expansion. Feudalism was an instrument of expansion, which by the time of, uh, with its idea of theocracy and kingship and so forth, by the time of parliamentary government, Quigley says that the parliamentary government was a way of uh, circumventing a worn out, dead, petrified uh, instrument of expansion, uh, feudalism. So they left the monarchy intact. They just went around it and created parliamentary government. And then uh, finally, the conversion of the English uh, to barbarian tribes to Western Christianity was pretty much universal across the board here in this whole zone. So then he comes to the conclusion then that there's no way in which we can consider Great Britain to be the center of Western history, since it obviously involves Germany, Italy, Spain, uh, France, the whole, all these countries are nation states that are inter-involved inextricably. So this is going to be our unit of historical study as one of these great civilizations, which he calls uh, Western civilization. And he thinks of these as societies. These are societies, which is his term for the high civilizations, of which he's going to say there's something like 20 something of them. And then so the field of which Great Britain is a part, uh, that is precisely what it is. And he looks at, um, the, uh, looks for an example amongst the Greeks, and he says that, let's take a look at the Greek city-states, in, in their case, uh, Athens, Sparta, Chalcis, Corinth. Um, they had to respond to a series of challenges dealing with overpopulation. So they were becoming overpopulated, and each of these city-states responded in a different way. Chalcis and Corinth responded to it by uh, colonizing, by moving uh, colonizing into Sicily and Italy and so forth, um, whereas Sparta then uh, simply attacked, aggressively attacked all their neighbors, and so her response was strictly military, but that was a dead end and doomed them to maintaining a permanently militaristic society. And then Athens solved the problem by exporting uh, uh, wine and olives and creating a, a rich economy through export. So each of one of these city-states then have to be conceived of as parts of a whole responding to the same environmental challenge. In their case, uh, their soil wasn't good for uh, agriculture. Um, all right, and then, uh, so moving right along here, so the extension of the field in space then, and here's, here we have this map, where he basically push it, pushes it back to 775, which is the time of Charlemagne. And he says that this is, under the time of Charlemagne, and these are his grandsons, 843, uh, Charlemagne is back in 775. This was all unified under the Frankish kingdom. Uh, and so this was geographically the whole, even though England wasn't subject to her rule, Nonetheless, we've already demonstrated that she was part of this whole historical unit here. And then so um, this is the geographical field, the, its, its extent in space. And um, so he points out this really interesting thing when he's talking about, um, well, let's look for a second at this map where he comes to say, now, there are four great zones in the world today as of this writing, and this was written in 1933, and he also has a model, let's see what the, the zones are over here. Civilizations current in 1952, let's bring them in a little closer here. 
Um, we have the um, the Far Eastern here, um, the Indian or Hindu Indic, as he calls it, uh, going over here over the mountains, the Himalayas, and so forth. The Russian is over here. Islam cuts across North Africa, uh, went as far as Spain at one point, and then uh, then we have the the Western, which includes America over here. We can see San Francisco, San Diego. Um, Brazil, the whole South American world. Um, so these are the domains that are up and running in his time. So now, but he has this three-stage model that I want to take a look at here of three different distinct generations of this species, what he calls his, a species, high civilization, whereby the first generation comes into being around between 3500 and 3000 BC, first in Sumer. Sumer is first off the mark here. And then in Egypt, so we have Sumer here, and then Egypt. This is generation number one. Each of them has two satellite civilizations. The Minoan is a satellite civilization of the Egyptian, and over here the Indus Valley, Harappa. But they both come in about a thousand years later, 20, 2600 for the two satellites. Harappa is a satellite of the Sumerian. Um, they w had extensive trade relationships here going up and down the, the Persian Gulf. And then he's got this other one over here, the Shang, but I think that's really probably uh, Neolithic that he's talking about here, like the Yangshao farmers and the Longshan uh, warriors. And then so the second, with the second generation, we've got coming across the board in the very troubled millennium, 2000 BC to 1000, we have the Hellenic, which is his name for the Greco-Roman, the Hittites, who are a satellite of the Babylonic civilization, uh, and the Syriac civilization, which is basically his term for the Magians, Middle Eastern civilization, and then uh, the Indic civilization over here, and the Sinic uh, civilization there, second generation. Third generation then comes in across the board here, Far Eastern. Um, this is the Far Eastern. He's got the Far Eastern with Japan unified with Korea as a separate society from China, the Far Eastern. We've got India here still thoroughly up and running, Iran, what he calls the Iranic civilization, as distinct from the Arabic, which is more narrowly unified uh, to, confined rather to Egypt here, and uh, the Middle East, Mecca, Medina, and so forth. And then uh, we have Orthodox Christian Russian civilization, and the Orthodox Christians over here uh, in Greece. And then we have the Western over here, and we have the abortive. There are two abortive Western societies, the abortive Scandinavian, which was became abortive the moment that it converted to Christianity about the year 1000, and the abortive Far Western Christian, which would have comprised a separate society based on the Irish uh, Celtic transformation of Christianity as a, as a separate world from uh, the papacy, from, from Rome. So that's his what his ultimate map is going to be, these three distinct generations. The third generation is more concerned with creating what he calls universal churches, um, large sc macro scale religions that are still alive in the world uh, to this day. And then so he says uh, in this chapter, um, yes, that the four great zones are uh, the Orthodox Christian or Russian, uh, Islamic society, Hindu society, and Far Eastern. And those are still up and running in the world when the far west, the Western uh, Christian civilization comes into being. So then we have the extension then into time, and this is where the Treaty of Verdun becomes very interesting because Lothair, these are the three grandsons who are of Charlemagne who have divided. Charles the Bold has the area that basically corresponds to Aquitaine uh, in, in France. Over here we have Germany, and then Lothair. Uh, and the, the uh, controversial Lotharingian corridor, it was very important to him as the eldest that he have his grandfather's palace at Aachen and also uh, Rome. And so this central corridor then becomes a kind of, as Toynbee puts it, a kind of spinal backbone from out of which the West expands in all directions, um, down this way into the Americas, uh, this way to North America, this way to Spain and so forth into South America, uh, around Africa to India and so forth. Just continuous expansion. Um, and then so he says, if we look at the previous society that was there, namely the, namely the, the Roman Empire, um, its boundaries, and here's the Roman Empire at, at its height, its widest geographical extent, 
in about 116, 117 AD, whereby the boundary is along the Rhine. Um, this is the boundary of this civilization. And so everything that was beyond was regarded as the barbarian hinterlands. And Tony B. calls the barbarians an external proletariat. Uh, and on the inside, we have a dominant minority uh, because Rome has to lead now by force. It's no longer a creative minority as Greece was uh, that operated by mimesis uh, through imitation of a creative minority. So it's run by the dominant uh, minority and there's an internal proletariat, namely the Christians, who are in that society but not of it. Uh, and then they will form, eventually, once these two intermingle, the Christian internal proletariat and the barbarian external proletariat will mingle to create uh, a completely separate society. And so note that that boundary line here uh, is the Rhine. It is also the boundary between uh, these two, uh, Lothar and his brother, um, which becomes basically the boundary between what he calls the Promethean North, uh, which is forward-looking, and the Epimethean South, uh, which is backward-looking and bound to outdated, worn-out Mediterranean culture forms. And then so he puts it imaginatively, he says that the, a rib was then taken from the side of the dying Hellenic civilization, the rib being this boundary along the Rhine, to become the spinal backbone then of a new civilization, namely the Western civilization. So that's how he sees it in this chapter, and that, that's what sets us up. Um, this now is the unit, of the field of intelligible study of the Western society. And so we'll, uh, we'll leave it there uh, for that.